breakthroughs coming this morning. Amen. Good. 
down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Over my head, I know that you won't let me 
You may be seated. So glad that you're here today. My name is Jerry. I'm the pastor, and I just want to welcome you. Hope that you feel totally at peace while you're here. Are you ready to have a great service today? You know, I want, to, like, my goal here by the end of the service is when we leave, that we can say that we met with Jesus. That's the whole idea. So if we don't meet with Jesus, if we don't experience him, if we don't leave differently than we came, what's the use of doing this, right? And so we want to leave completely changed. I want to be more like Jesus. There was a time when the disciples, they said, we know that these, even though they're uneducated and they, they don't know too much, but we know that they have been with Jesus. And I want today, when you go to your place for food or you go to your community, that you walk in, they say, man, that person has been with Jesus. And so today we're going to be starting a brand new series called The Beatitudes. I know we're going to have a good time. Before that, I just want to welcome everybody. If you're a guest here, I want to say welcome home. Hope you feel at home. Uh, if you just take a, a, the blue card, everybody in the room, if you could take the blue card that's in the uh, seat pocket in front of you or pew pocket in front of you, if you take that, fill it out, you can drop it in the giving boxes that are in the back. If you're a guest, take that to the desk and we'll make sure that we give it a gift uh, as a gift. Uh, we're, we have received an offering uh, through the boxes. We don't pass a bucket around here. Uh, there's giving boxes in the back. You can give online. You can give using the app. Either way, thank you for your continued support. Next week, uh, Pastor Rashid is going to be sharing just a few moments for us. He's a bishop, oversees like 26 churches in the Middle East. He's getting ready to go on a tour over there to have a conference training other pastors. And we're going to have just a few moments. He's going to share part of the service because I want you to know that where your dollars go. Every dollar that we give, 10% of it goes to missions. We give away 10% of everything. So it's, it's awesome. Just like we tithe personally, as a church, we tithe corporately. And he, we're going to be able to hear a report of what he's doing uh, over in the Middle East. Pretty cool, isn't it? Listen, if you're a guest, feel under no obligation to give. Giving is what people who call Connection Point their home. That's how we, we worship God through our giving. Well, I'm telling you, we're going to have a great time. Can, I, can we start with prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are here. We lift up God. Uh, those who are hurting, those who are, who are just remembering 21 years ago on 9-11 what happened. Those moms and dads and brothers and sisters who woke up not knowing that it would be their last day. God, those who are still hurting from this, I pray, God, that you would bring peace to them. You would bring healing to them. It would be a time of, of change in their heart. God, we're never going to forget because we know that you will work all things together for good. God, we're, if it's not good and you're not done yet, we know it. And so we're still praying for your good to be shown in this situation. God, we lift up those who are sick. We lift up Jody who's just had a stroke. I pray that you would be with her and, and restore her. For those who are sick in the hospital, Father, I pray that you would you'd be with them. Those who are traveling, I pray that you put angels round about them, give them traveling mercies. God, I pray that you would, you would change us to be the people you want us to be. We pray all of this in accordance to Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. This is now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power which is at work within us. Praise be to him through the churches, through all generations, forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's watch this video real quick. It's a heavy pulpit, isn't it, brother? <laughs> That's right. Hey, we have people who are watching us across the nation and around the world. Would you welcome them into the church house? Would you welcome? Give them a hand clap. And, yeah. 
And if you're ever in this area, please stop on by. We promise we'll make you feel right at home. So today we're talking about the Beatitudes. It comes from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is actually part of the greatest sermon ever preached. It was preached by Jesus. It takes place in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. And if you get a chance, go home and read 5, 6, and 7, and you'll see this is the preamble to the whole message. This is Jesus' introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. I've been to where he preached this, on the north side of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. It was beautiful. And you think about, man, this is really cool. He was able to stand at a place and preach at the Mount, and his voice traveled. It's really, really cool. And so when I read this, I put myself in that place, and I smell the, the Sea of Galilee, and I can feel the... the Sun just beating down, and I hear him, and I could imagine him. When you're there, you, you do as well. You could imagine him saying these words. They're called the Beatitudes because I, another way of saying it would be the be happy attitudes. The be happy attitudes. They're, they're really eight, some people say nine, Beatitudes where he says, blessed are, and then it completes with, for they will, or and they will. So it's a conditional. This equals that. This equals that. And so we're going to spend the next eight weeks going over the Beatitudes. So this will help you. After that, we're going into a series called At the Movies, where we did it last year at Christmas time. We're doing it in November. And there's a time where we're seeing where the world and Christianity combine and showing the movies. So if you have friends who are non-believers, it's a great place to bring them because we'll show how Jesus is still in the movies. They just didn't know it. And so that's going to be coming up after that, and then we're, we'll be in our Christmas series. And then, oh my goodness, can you believe Christmas is so close? Oh, I'm glad that we're in the Burr months, you know, the Burr months, September, October, November, December. This is the only Burr that you get in Florida. And uh, as a big man, I'm really excited to be here. But we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, the Be Happy Attitudes. Now the word happy comes from the great... The, the, the Latin word hap, which we get the word happenings. And so the word happy is connected to happenings. It's the same word. So if things are happening one way, then I'm happy the other. When things aren't happy, then I'm not, when things aren't happening the way I want it to be, then I'm not happy, right? Do you understand? But God is not talking about when he says blessed are, that word blessed is actually another word that people will say happy are. But it's not happy based on the circumstances. It's happy based on the joy that God has given us that the world will never take away from us. Okay? So it's not situationally uh, relevant. So if my situation changes, I'm still going to be happy because I have joy. We used to sing this song, This joy that I have, the world can't take it away. Because the world didn't give it, so the world can't take it away, right? Jesus gave me this joy that I have inside. It's deep. It's further than the happenings. And so when he says blessed are, he's saying happy are. Happy meaning the joy. There's going to be a joy that, that's inexpressible and full of glory when he's talking about the joy, happiness. So blessed. So let's read picking up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's next week. Blessed are the meek. How many people believe we need more meekness in the world? Yes. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will, what? See God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all different kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word brings light. We pray that it would bring light to our situation and to our lives today. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. You may be seated. So these statements reveal where true happiness can be found. These statements show the potential of what can be ours. So these are available. If you do this, if this happens, this is what's going to be happening. So if you're poor in spirit, yours will be the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but somebody, when, when Jesus came on the scene, he's in a place where the Romans are running things. The Jewish folks, the Israelis, they were, they were occupied. They were in an occupied territory. They didn't have the rights. They didn't have the privileges. They didn't have everything that the Romans had. They were second-hand citizens. And Jesus sits down and he says to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom that they knew was the kingdom of Caesar, the kingdom of Rome. And so he says there's another kingdom which is bigger than Rome, and that's the kingdom of heaven. And that's important for us to remember as believers that there is something bigger than the kingdom of the United States. There is a kingdom of heaven. There is something bigger than what we're a part of. And he says, when you understand that, when you understand, you have to be poor, though, in spirit to get it. And I want to unpack that for us today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That, that word poor in the Greek, there's really two definitions. One definition of poor is they don't have enough. They just don't have enough. They, they, they have food, but they don't have enough food. They have lodging, but it's not really good lodging. And then there's another definition, which means they have absolutely nothing at all. And that is what Jesus says here. Blessed are those who have nothing at all in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean by that? Well, my definition would be this. Blessed is the person who realizes that they are completely destitute, utterly helpless. One who realizes their absolute need for God. When we get to the point where we are absolutely destitute, utterly helpless, when we realize our absolute need for God, then you will be blessed. Then you will be happy. Does that make sense to you? Like, it seems to me like if I don't have all those things, I'm not happy. If, I am, if I'm destitute, if I'm helpless, if I have nothing in myself, then I feel like I'm not enough. And that's really the problem that we have in this conversation in America when I'm, I'm trying to give you this, this message today. It's probably the hardest of the Beatitudes for all of us to grasp because we have a lot. We have a whole lot. But I think that if you look at the different scriptures, and I, I, you can read through them, I'm not going to pull them on the screen, but Matthew and, and the NLT and the good and, and God's Word and the NCV, they all talk about the happy are those who have the great spiritual needs. They're happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. But the problem in our society is that we don't understand how utterly poor that we are. Because if you have a lot, which we have as Americans, we have a lot. It's tough for you to see where you don't have a lot. Your stuff gets in the way. Your opportunity gets in the way. Do you know that 99.5% of the world would change places with you on your worst day? 99.5% of the world would change places with you on your worst day. It's still better than their best. That's, that's incredible because we have a, we become so successful in America. We become so successful. And it's not a, a bad thing to be successful. Don't hear me say that. I'm just saying that sometimes our success can clout what really is going on can cloud whatever is really going on. Because we will never depend on something we don't think we need. Let me say that again. We will never depend on something that we don't think that we need. Because most of us think that we can get there by ourselves. I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm going to get there. 21 years ago, remember 21 years ago was 9-11 on this day. Do you remember where you were? I was in an office. I was watching. I was working, and somebody said, hey, man, you got to turn on. And he brought in, like, this portable TV. That's how long ago it was, you know, with an antenna. And over the air TV, and he said, and we watched, and we saw, I saw, 
tower number one on fire. And then I saw as plane number two ran into the World Trade Center. Now, in prior service, I was in the Army. At this time, I'm five years out of the Army. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. This is, this is it. This is an act of war. Who, who did this? This is, this is terrible, right? I'm thinking we're going to... And, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking about my, my boys. I have two boys. Austin was four at the time. My other son was one. And I'm thinking, what kind of world am I bringing my boys into? They're going to be in a world of war their whole time. I was born 1973, at the end of the Vietnam War. I basically had peace for the most part of my life, right? And I was thinking, there's no way that my kids are going to go through this kind of war. But I remember one of the great outcomes of that was when the president stood on the rubble and said, I hear you and soon they will hear you. And I was, as American, I was proud. As a soldier, I was even prouder. Like, get them! And then I saw senators and Congress people linked arm in arm, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, singing God bless America. I saw people standing united in the face of the worst thing that our generation has ever seen. Oh, that we would stand arm in arm again, united, instead of divided again. I think our world needs it. But we will never depend on something if we don't think that we don't, if we don't think we need it. Most of us have become too satisfied with where we live. That's why missions trips are fantastic. Has anybody been in a, on a mission trip, a foreign mission trip, and you've been to some, there's a few of it, okay, great. And if you haven't, it will change your life. My hope is that you don't try to spend the rest of your life trying to go up and down 466 and 441, trying to figure out where you're going to eat today. I hope that's not how you spend your life. Because you realize that most of you go on a mission trip and you go to places where people are, have absolutely nothing, and you realize that most of the world doesn't live that way. They live, live on pennies a day. I loved taking students, student ministry, man. Are we doing to Mexico, to Costa Rica, went all over. And the coolest thing is when you go there and you pull up, the kids go crazy. They love that you're there. And these kids, they only have like one outfit. The houses that they live in aren't really houses. They're shanty, lean-to shanties, made of corrugated metal. There's no running water. There's no sewerage. They, take, they go to the bathroom in a bucket and then throw it out in a ditch that runs through the barrios. It's a, a terrible place it, it, of, where, as Americans, we're going, oh, this is disgusting, ill. Where one person climbs a pole, my guys who are electrician and the linemen, they climb a pole and they, like, steal electricity and goes from one to the other to the other in these metal buildings, real safe. And we pull up in our bus, we open up, and they go nuts because they think it's like Santa Claus coming to see him, right? They're thinking, who's coming out of this expensive motor coach, you know, coming? We, we walk out, and the kids are ecstatic. They are having so much, because we're going to play soccer with them, and we're going to give some chicharrones to them. You know what chicharroni is? Chicharroni is a, a pork rind with a sriracha sauce on top of it. It's so good, right? And we're going to give these to the kids, and they're like, yeah! It's fantastic. Why? Because they are so poor, but they are so happy because stuff hasn't gotten in their way. And I love the testimonies of the kids coming back the last day when we need to brief before we come back. I don't even want a refrigerator when I go home, you know, because they realize that their stuff has gotten in the way of true happiness. And Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. When they realize they are utterly destitute, then they will experience the kingdom of heaven. So it's hard as your pastor in this society, in this area, to teach you 
how to be poor in spirit. Because we live in a society that you did well throughout your life, you now get to retire in the villages or the villages adjacent areas. Dear Lord, this is amazing. We get to work in this area. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Are you kidding me? We don't pay state taxes in Florida. Praise the Lord. If you're watching from somewhere else, come on. It's, it, the water's good here. Right? And we have all these things going on, and we're so happy, but we become so destitute, and we don't realize it. When we realize the only thing that we need comes for the one who has it, it will change everything in our life. The only thing that we need comes from the one who has it. So there's a book in the New Testament. It's the only book of prophecy in the New Testament. It's called the Apocrypha, or everybody knows it as John's Revelation, right? John, who wrote the Gospel of John and First and Second and Third John, the beloved, the one who Jesus loved, the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. This John, he's the last disciple alive. He's living in exile on the Isle of Patmos. Tradition says that he had been boiled alive in oil by this time and is now as an old man living upon the rocks. And during this time, the same Jesus that walked with him for three years, three and a half years, shows up to him on the Isle of Patmos. Could you imagine what that would be like? This man who's given his life for the gospel, he's the elder statesman. It doesn't get any older than John the apostle. And Jesus shows up to him and he pens these words in, in, in uh, the, the book of Revelation. There's seven churches, modern churches in those days, that Jesus has issues with. And my friends, the same issues he has problems with us today in our modern churches. All seven of them. And the one in the church of Laodicea, he writes in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Now let me just say, anybody like watching MasterChef? Right? There's never a dish that they serve that's lukewarm. It's either cold, like a ceviche, or it's hot. But never lukewarm. We know that, that right? He said, so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. How many people in your prayer time, you, if you heard Jesus say this to you, you'd be like, oh, praise the Lord, I had the best prayer time. He's saying, you think that you have it all together. Think about this. He's speaking to us today. We think we have it all together, but your stuff makes you think that you have it all. But to be, the reality is, in your spirit, you are wretched. You are poor. You are blind. You're pitiful. You're naked. Without Jesus, my friends, we are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Many times we try to do spiritual things. We go to a church, we serve, we give. And we think that that is going to make us all right with God. That doesn't make us all right with God. That just checks some boxes on your religious card. The result of someone who realizes that they are wretched realizes that they are poor and pitiful and blind and naked. When you become that spiritually, when you realize that's who you are, the Bible says you will be blessed. So four things I want to talk to you today about four things that you don't have, even though you think you might. And then how Jesus support, supplies the other four things that we don't have. Let me turn on this fan real quick. So listen, don't be afraid to shout. Don't say amen or oh me. Just go ahead, all right? Otherwise, I'll start asking for it. So what does God provide? Number one, without Jesus, I pay for my own sins. Without Jesus, I have to pay for my own sins. Every one of us, listen, every one of us has sinned. And listen, just asking for forgiveness of your sin 
doesn't equal forgiveness. If I sin against my wife and I ask her to forgive me, if she doesn't forgive me, am I forgiven? No. Asking is part of the solution. Just because the people before Christ sinned, just because we, apart from God, sin, it's not until we ask him and he is willing to forgive our sin. Let me show you through the power of the gospel what I mean, through the Bible. The Bible says all sins are forgiven when they're paid for. So uh, uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Listen, friends, it's not just doing spiritual things. Sins have a bill attached to it, and the cost of it is death. Hell is full of people right now paying for their sin debt. The cost of sin is a bill that I cannot pay except for separated from God. The second part of that verse, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say amen right there. Because of Jesus, I have the free gift of salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. Because of Jesus, my sins are forgiven. Because of Jesus, I have salvation. I'm saved from my situation. Because of Jesus, I have eternal life. I'm not going to live separated from God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. When I say yes to Jesus, he says yes to me. He already said yes to me. He's been waiting for me to say yes. And when I say yes, he takes my name and he writes it in the Lamb's book of life. And I am saved. That's the good news. That's the gospel. On the other hand, there's two books. At the end of your life, you're going to be judged, either from the Lamb's book of life or the books. The books are all the bad things, all the bad thoughts that you've ever done in your life. There's a record being made. But the moment you say yes to Jesus, you move from the books to the book. I'm telling you, I'd rather, you're going to either live and be judged by the books, and you don't want to be judged by the books. All the bad things, the bad thoughts, dear God, just today on the drive-in. <laughs> right? I mean, think about the, the things that have happened, and the anger, and the bitterness, and the malice, and that we talked about that last week, about taking on and putting off, uh, uh, taking off and putting on. He says, the wages of sin is death. But then look at Ephesians, what it says this, Ephesians 2. He says, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, which you used to live in when you followed the ways of the world. All of us have also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following through with its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of, say it, wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved. <laughs> I'm going to preach happy here, man. This is going to be exciting. Blessed are those who realize that you ain't got nothing without Jesus. Mm, if I had a Hammond B B3 organ right now, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I incurred a debt that I couldn't pay, and Jesus paid my bill, paid in full, once and for all. And that makes me love God. That makes me worship God. That makes me adore God like nothing else. I'm amazed in worship why we aren't more expressive. Because when you understand what has been done for you, oh dear God, you can do nothing but worship God. When you realize that you are nothing without him. But our piety gets in the way, brother. That's uncivilized. We wouldn't do that, darling. Mama and papa. Come on, man. When you realize what has been done for you, what has been, it's huge. We get to worship 
And man, when we worship, it should be like nothing else we've ever done before. There should be a, a sense of gratitude. God, I'm naked and poor, wretched and blind. I come to you and I'm nothing. I'm still nothing, God, before you. I know you call me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I know you call me son. I know you call me daughter. I know you call me blessed. But God, I'm still nothing without you. And once we get to this point where it's not about us, it's about him. We understand our worship service isn't about the songs that we sing. It's about the heart that we're trying to touch, which is the heart of Christ. And if we could ever get past our preferences and start worshiping God, it will change your life. Without Jesus, I can only cope through my pain and my personhood. Without Jesus, I can only cope with my pain. The world says, oh, just you're, you're going to cope with it. Just You'll get over it. They put Band-Aids on our wounds. But I'm still hating on the inside. Just learn to cope with it. Learn to work through your issues. Well, I'm just a mean person because generationally, I'm mean, my dad's mean, my grandpa's mean. I'm Scottish. Scottish people are mean. That's what we do. Get you in my belly. Break the cycle. You don't have to be what you've been brought into the world in. You get to be who Jesus says you are. And if he says that you are free, who the son says free is free indeed. Well, my dad was a womanizer. That's why I'm a womanizer. Baloney. You're a womanizer because of your sin nature that you continue to lean into. Take it off and put on the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No longer doing that anymore. Today I am set free. I am whole because of the blood of Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 6 it says, They offer sacrificial treatments or superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. They give assurances of peace, but there is no peace. They're putting band-aids on things that Jesus wants to heal. Because of Jesus... So without Jesus, I, I, I have to cope through it all. But with Jesus, because of Jesus, I have the power to be healed and transformed. It's not my power, it's his power that's at work within me. 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 says, He himself bore my sins in his body on the cross that we may die to sins and live for righteousness, by whose wounds we have been made we have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. My friends, you have someone who is overseeing your soul. He's in charge. He's got your back. God's in charge. Your soul can be overseen. He will heal you and transform you. I know there are people in this room today through this past week, you've had been tormented. You've had panic attacks. You've had worries. You've had insecurities. You lost sleep. Your stress levels right now are higher than they've ever been before in your life. And it ends today. I said it ends today in Jesus' name. Who the Son says free is free indeed. I'm going to pray for every person in the name of Jesus. If that's you right now, just lift up your hand and say, God, I'm going through that. Father, look at every hand here in this room. You know every heart that's raised. Those who can't even raise their hand because it hurts so bad. Father, I pray that you break every chain. You release them in Jesus' name. You heal the pain. You heal the hurt. God, you restore them. You make them new. They are new creatures according to your power and your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Mm. I'm sorry, I don't mean to shout, I just get so excited. I just get so excited. We, he didn't come to put a Band-Aid on me, he came to heal me. Not just healed, but he wants to transform me. I don't need to stay who I am. Hallelujah, hallelujah, I don't have to stay who I am. I can be who he's called me to be. You see, salvation isn't just to save you from your sins. Salvation is to save your marriage, 
Salvation is to restore your sanity. Salvation is to heal your family. Salvation is to heal your country. Jesus didn't save you from your sins. He saved you to be who he wants you to be. He looked inside of you and he made, I said, put, I put greatness on the inside of Joanna and she's going to do great things. And we say, yeah, but just my sins. No, there is more than the salvation of sins. God is going to do much more than that in your life. Not only does he want to save you, he wants to transform and he wants to heal you. Shout amen, somebody. Because what happens, and in Galatians chapter uh, uh, five, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We don't have that on our own, but the moment we say yes to Jesus, he starts working those on the inside of us. And I'm no longer the same. I've been transformed in Jesus' name. Touch your neighbor and say, I've been transformed in Jesus' name. Go ahead. Adam. Look at the person that you didn't look at and say, I've been transformed in Jesus' name. I'm not the same. Listen, you're leaving here a different person in Jesus' name. Point number three. Without Jesus, I'm going to try to find or create my own life. I'm going to try to do it on my own. Without Jesus, I'm going to try to create my own life. But look what Jeremiah says. Let me, before I get to that, before I get to Jeremiah, I just want you to tell you this. I believe that God has purpose on the inside of our hearts. Listen, listen up real close, listen. I think he's put a purpose in all of our lives, but he doesn't tell you what it is. He knows, and he wants you to ask him. Student ministry, people ask me, what am, what am I on here, what am I on the earth for, what's my purpose? I know who knows. Jeremiah 29, 11, behold, I know the plans for you, says the Lord God Almighty. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Because of Jesus, my friends, I have the ability to know who I am and what my life is all about. He's the shepherd of my soul. He's the overseer of my soul. Acts chapter 17, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. What does that mean? God knew that you would be born and be alive right now, September 11th, 2022. And he knew that you would be, that's your times, and he knew that where you would be in your appointed boundaries, the, the boundaries of your lands. This is where we are right now, the Tri-County area. God knew that you were going to be here. It's not a mistake that you were born. Maybe your parents made a mistake, but you're not the mistake. God appointed you for this time in this place to make a difference. God did it so we would seek him and reach out for him and find him because he's not very far away from any of us. That's why he said in him we live and we move and we have our being. Without Jesus, number four, I'm living my life for joys that fade away. Joys that fade away. You know, there's actually something that happens in, in um, I, for, I forgot the word. Um, if I wrote it down, I'd probably be smart next time. But in depression, it happens in depression, where the things that used to give you joy, give you joy no longer. Have you ever gone through something with things that used to, and I'm talking about the bad thing. I'm talking about like things that are joyful. Like you used to like doing this, but now you don't. And you're, you're stuck in this rut and you're going, ugh. It's because without Jesus, I'm living for joys that fade away. First Peter 1, 3 to 4 says, Praise be to God our Father through Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never spoil perish or fade. Think about that, that you are getting put into an inheritance of joy that's never going to fade away. It's never going to perish. That feeling that you're going to have will always be there. So because of Jesus, I can have the joy of living a life that glorifies God and impacts others. I can live a life that glorifies God and impacts others. 
John chapter 15 says, this is my Father's glory, that you what? Bear much fruit. Say it with me again. Bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. How do you prove that you're a disciple of Christ? Bear much fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, if you're not bearing fruit, what? I'm not a disciple. I'm not a follower. I'm doing it my own way. If I'm a follower of Christ, I'm going to bear fruit. A, a, a tree that is living bears fruit. A tree that is dying does not bear fruit. He says, prove that you're my disciples by bearing much fruit. I have told you this, why? So that my joy would be in you. Say, it's gonna be in me. And your joy will be complete. It's not a little joy. It's not just enough, a little dabble, do you? It's all the joy that you need. To think that he doesn't have enough, to have that he couldn't satisfy your joy meter, you just haven't felt his joy yet. When I bear much fruit, think about it. When I bear much fruit, why am I bearing fruit? How do I bear fruit? By investing in the lives of others. When I invest in the lives of others, that's when I find joy. When you serve others, when you serve others, we serve God by serving others, then you find true joy. Let me say that again because I stumbled over it. When you serve God by serving others, then you find true joy. If you're not serving God by serving others, of course you don't have joy. Of course you think you can do it by yourself. But once you realize without him I am nothing and because of him I can do all things and so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share what he's done for me with somebody else and I'm gonna help them. And when you start helping other people, oh, blessed are you. So if I was to sum up this, this blessed be beatitude, the big idea of this beatitude would be, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in this room, I thank you for showing up today. I thank you for giving inspiration and even perspiration. I thank you for that, God. I thank you that you were here. I thank you that lives are changed already. God, the sound of chains breaking happened during this service. People are leaving here changed and transformed and renewed because they heard the word of God. And they're not just going to be hearers, they're going to be doers of it. God, help us understand that without you, we're pitiful, we're poor, we're blind, we're wretched, naked. Nothing we have will ever satisfy that. It's only in who we have, and that's you. So as we serve others, while we serve you, God, I pray that my friends find pure joy. Now in this room, I know there might be people still in an attitude of prayer who have not connected with Jesus. He's not the Lord and Savior of your life. He's not in control. He's not the boss. You've been trying to do it your own way the whole time. But you realize that there's a debt that you've paid, that you've incurred, that you cannot pay. And you need him to pay the bill in full. It happens when you say yes to Jesus. And today, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand real high and look at me in the eyes so I know I'm praying for you. But you're gonna say, yes, Jesus, I give you my life, I submit my life to you, I'm gonna be a follower of you. That's on the count of three, you ready? One, two, three. If that's you, slip up your hand real high. Look at that, hands all over the place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, my goodness, my goodness. Awesome, you can put your hands down. Thank you, thank you. Maybe you're here and you've been following Christ for a long time, man, but your joy is gone. The fire in your heart towards God is cold. It might just be an ember right now. The Bible says a bruised reed and a smoldering fire, God will not despise. If you are bruised, if you are smoldering, if you just have a little bit, God wants to breathe life onto you. He wants to renew that fire inside of you. I know I'm speaking to you. I know I'm reading your mail, stepping on your toes, and I'm sorry 
But right now you say, I want to get right with God. I'm a Christian. I want to get right with God. I've tried it my own way. I'm done. I'm done. I surrender all to him. If that's you, slip your hand up real high and say, Pastor, that's me. I surrender. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All over the place. All over the place. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. That's awesome. Father, as we pray a prayer that says, Dear God, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for the things that I've done that have separated you and I. I give you my heart, my life. I'm 100% yours. You're 100% mine. Forgive me of my sins. Help me live the life you want me to live. Help me to become the person you've called me and destined and purposed for me to be and to live the life of, of serving you by serving others so I might find pure joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray and declare it. Amen, amen, and amen. Would you give the Lord a big woo -hoo! Come on, man. Give it up like you love Jesus. Come on, I love you, Lord.